welcome to Kotlin Conversations, where we're talking with just some of the many amazing speakers here at Kotlin Conf 2023. My name is Huynh Tuet Dao, and I have the pleasure of speaking with... My name is Holger. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm so... I'm, I'm thrilled to have you, Holger. And um, I, there's so many things I want to talk about to, to kind of do a little behind the scenes. We've been talking for about five minutes, so I we needed to turn on the camera to get talking. But just to start, um, Holger, uh, what do you do? Where are you based? And, and just generally, how did you get interested in Kotlin? That's a great question. So I'm an analytics solution architect, and I support manufacturing partners, mainly in semiconductor, but also automotive industry, to optimize their business and manufacturing processes. I got started in Colin many years ago, I would say. I think with the first major release, I was already on board. So it's my third time at KotlinConf, third time as a speaker as well. And I started my journey doing bioinformatics in high uh, throughput computing uh, experiments. And then I moved to data science, and now I moved more into simulation. And so um, I think that's actually what um, I love about both your talk and kind of just your perspective on Kotlin is that I'm an Android dev. So I have a very well-known and specific uh, perspective on Kotlin. And of course, you know, we, as you know, kind of noted in the keynote this morning, there's a much wider, you know, group of folks using Kotlin for backend. But, you know, for you, both in terms of data science and also process optimization, this is kind of a very niche uh, application for Kotlin. Um, can, can I just ask, like, you know, usually when I think of things like, say, simulations and even data science, I, I, there's a lot of other tech stacks that even me as someone kind of outside have heard of, you know, um, in terms of like notebooks and Python and Julia for data science. And, and I, I mean, I actually did a little bit of kind of like um, process optimization research in, in school a tiny, tiny bit, nowhere near what you do. And so and, and I think we wrote that in a C++ uh, simulator. What, what is it about, you know, can you kind of maybe compare the tech stack of other people in your domain in, in business optimization and data science. And why did you think, what, what made you think, okay, Kotlin is a good option for this? That's an excellent question. So to be honest, I still do the majority of my analytical workload, not in Kotlin, but in tools like R, because I mean, they are more major, more evolved, they do exactly what I want. However, uh, when you do so, you hit the wall sooner or later because if you study complex systems like complex business processes or manufacturing processes, uh, the simplicity of a scripting language such as Python or R, it doesn't scale. So you cannot express and model these complex dependencies and, and sub-processes and uh, I mean the different interaction patterns in a scripting language. I mean you can but it's a very tedious process and that's why I then like to use something more structured, something which is statically typed, which provides a better developing experience. And that's why I think Kotlin is a very good choice here. And clearly, in order to, I mean, not introduce a gap between the data analytics part and the modeling part, I think it's very interesting to study and to try to also move some of the analytical parts into the Kotlin domain. So to take a step back, um, let's go ahead and actually kind of maybe more in detail describe what you were actually doing. So we, we mentioned that you are currently working on optimizing business processes and doing modeling. What, what does that look like? So what is that? What I mean, because obviously as an Android dev, y'all know what I do. I make apps, UI, database. But what is it exactly that you do for a client that, and I know in your talk you're going to speak on, for example, uh, silicon wafer manufacturing. Yes. What do you do and how does the model, what, what problem is the modeling solving? Yes, let's stick to the example. So the customers, they ask us, how can we produce more? How can we produce, I don't know, 1,000 wafers more per month? Mm -hmm. And what they do is they dump an insane amount of data to us. So mm -hmm. give us dumps from databases, from logs and whatsoever. And then we start diving into it. So we yeah. really do some exploratory analysis. And then we, okay, get some first ideas about how we potentially could improve their business or their process. And to validate these hypotheses, what we then do is we take the information which we gather from the interviews with uh, the on-site colleagues and also from the data, we condense this information into an actual model, so an abstraction of the real process, which uh, is implemented in a simulation. And then we can run their process in an abstracted manner to play out or to try out different types of process execution or scheduling mo modes just to see, okay, which model works best to achieve their optimization goal. 
And so I, I'm sorry, So and, and you had mentioned previously before we started rolling the camera that it's almost like just tweaking different knobs and then seeing like kind of, you know, the, the output, whether it, me it meets some kind of desired goal or metric. Exactly, exactly, because I mean, the, the majority of processes in business, they're very complex. So there is no easy way to tune them. So there's not just one knob which you can tune and then you start making more money, but it's a complex interplay which you have to govern. And it's not clear from intuition. Also, if you're very experienced and if you're very long in a particular business, how to do so. And with a simulation, on the other hand, you can explore ideas very easily in a risk-free environment. That's why we think it's a very good tool if you have a complex uh, problem at hand and you want to achieve a certain optimization goal. And, and I love that because, you know, as you mentioned, you know, there are people probably in that space that have, you know, domain experience, you know, long experience. But, you know, and, and to some extent, you know, obviously that their input is valuable, but there is a scalability because we're human yes. beings. Yes. And I, I love the idea that you are synthesizing the human knowledge, the experience, but then allowing, you know, making it scalable to kind of try different permutations on things. Um, so there is still quite a bit of a human developer element in it. It's not just say, you know, stick a bunch of numbers or no, no. The data into a thing. There is interpretation and obviously your skill in abstracting and modeling something. Definitely, definitely. So we always, I mean, need to put the, the experts into the center of the discussion because they know best what's happening mm -hmm. and they also have hypotheses about how to perform better. And then we can take their ideas and actually explore them. We can yeah, shape them into, render them into numbers. And the, the beauty of, of Kotlin is that it's like from a, from a language perspective on a level that we can also communicate it to non-technical colleagues. So, I mean, if you write down a process, we can talk about it because it's, I mean, if, if done correctly, it's on a level where you can actually see your process in code so we can execute it. But on the other hand side, we can also do process reviews together with the domain specialists. I love that because I think sometimes, you know, any kind of data or information oftentimes the lack of visualization can be what impedes people to making connections and finding patterns. And as you said, by laying it out, it kind of is there. So you can start kind of putting the pieces together. I love that. Um, so not to spoil too much of your talk, because we really, really, of course, would think you would super enjoy uh, watching Holder's talk. But, you know, um, just to kind of maybe give a little bit of a taste of it, you have created in Kotlin your own kind of like simulation framework. Is that a right way of phrasing it uh, called Kalasim? Yes, it's a discrete event simulation framework, so it's not about continuous changes. So it's not a physics engine where you can model friction and gravity. It's more about processes where you have discrete changes, like you take the bottle and you put it to different positions. Something discrete has changed here. And the same idea applies to many business processes. So the engine which I have built and which I'm going to present tomorrow is about, uh, uh, I mean, is, is meant to support industrial engineers mainly to model their processes. And to make it more approachable, I will, uh, I mean, present different ways to visualize complex models. I mean, on the one hand side, I will use actual, uh, I mean, rendering using a framework called Open Render to really create a, like a digital twin of a process where you have the knobs exposed so you can tune them. It's really fun, so I will also give a live demo of this. And also as another nice demonstration, I will show how we can take a simulation and then use the analytical capabilities, which are emerging more and more within the Kotlin ecosystem to study the data in place. I, I absolutely love that. And I, you know, I, I saw like, you know, reading through the uh, Collison page that, and, and again, this is a, my kind of lack of understanding, but you kind of really emphasize that Collison is code first as opposed to low code or no code. Do you mind explaining to, uh, the lay folks in the audience, what does that mean and why was that important to you in building Collison? Yes. So there's quite a few uh, simulation tools out there. So it's not a new topic. Mm -hmm. And many of them are very visual, so you can drag your actors onto some kind of virtual workbench and then you can connect them with little lines. The problem is, is that this does not scale with the complexity of real systems. Mm -hmm. So like in a real world process, you have so many dependencies, you cannot simply draw this. So it becomes more an engineering question about how can we model such a system. That's why I think uh, using a code first approach is much more uh, uh, efficient and it's also needed to model complex processes. That is really cool. Um, so um, is there, especially when you're modeling something with Colosim, I kind of asked a little bit beforehand, but you know, there's so many different processes that I think that we as consumers can see. Um, to what extent, you know, do you, what, where, where's the real challenge? Is it always just kind of breaking down the problem? Is it synthesizing information? Like um, I know something that's come up a lot in the last several years is supply chain. Um, 
Is there a limit to the scope or scale of a particular process or problem that you can model? Uh, like, does it have to be at the scale of, you know, a single factory, let's say, or can you actually scale kind of a broad, like, you know, multi-modal like process easily? Like, how, yes. does, how does that work? Yeah, it's a good question. So I would argue that you can, I mean, model at every level and every complexity with this framework I'm presenting, as long as the uh, events are discrete, so the changes are uh, having a discrete nature. Uh, and I think then we can scale very nicely. And the domain I'm particular, I mean, uh, interested in, and which I'm also working on a daily basis, is semiconductor production, which is considered by many folks as the most complex industry of all. And I think, yeah, we are doing a very good job there, so we haven't faced any scalability issues yet. I'm actually really glad that you're working on it because obviously, um, I guess to kind of go a little off topic here with Kotlin, but obviously we've discovered the um, fragility of kind of like the semiconductor like industry and, and, and supply chain. So I think that obviously it is very important and a good subject. I can see why you're very interested in it. Um, kind of to step back a little bit, um, you know, in terms of like Kotlin and, you know, like you've worked in many different areas, not data science, not business optimization. Um, you know, what is it that, do you see, do you foresee a future where, you know, more people are shifting to Kotlin um, to kind of work in these areas as you have? Do you, do you see that in the future or is this just something, do you, do you still feel like there's going to be, you know, mostly kind of the established tech stack sticking around for a while? That's a very tricky question. I first would need to build a simulation to model the process and then I could give you an answer. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it's, so a, it's like a hard prediction to make. Um, I mean, it, it really depends. I mean, this morning we saw this lovely, I mean, teaser video yeah. in the opening keynote. And I think if such a tool stack would become real, and I think it's going to become real very soon, I think it will be very easy to also onboard non-technical uh, colleagues into the platform because you don't need to be a programmer, I mean, uh, or a developer to use a simulation engine. I think you can also, and I think this is also something which the community should strive for, to onboard less technically focused folks uh, into the platform to solve their domain specific problems. And this can be analytical tasks, this could be a simulation, and probably there's also many other problems which you can solve without becoming a, a developer yourself. I, I like that because obviously you are doing the hard work now of talking to the domain experts and then synthesizing that with the technical, you know, kind of modeling side. But, you know, you're saying that if the tooling gets better, then we can actually more do the opposite where you can pull the domain expert in and empower them really to kind of um, more kind of more directly participate in the optimization process. And that's also a process which I'm already on. So, I mean, I work with industrial engineers on a daily basis mm -hmm. and that I onboard them into Kotlin. And for sure, this cannot work if it's too complex, if it's too technical. Mm -hmm. So they need more direct paths where they can see the light at the end of the tunnel about, because they have the specific idea in mind, something they want to model, something they want to study or analyze. So you have to prepare the ecosystem in a way that, yeah, you have an, I mean, not too steep onboarding curve. So if, if everyone starts kind of being more incapable of making simulations, is that going to mean that you're going to have to change uh, your, your kind of like... Um have a career change again if everyone is able to kind of self-serve I would and, I mean <laughs> actually, <laughs> model actually if you look into the app store you said you're on mobile so most yeah. of the apps uh, or many of these games uh, if, if which you can find on Play Store for instance mm -hmm. they are simulation games so it's yeah that's true I mean all these build your hotel empire or yeah. build your whatever empire and it's people nice. love playing them so everyone I think many many people are super curious about simulation but the problem with these games is you're bound to whatever the game designer had in mind. And with the beauty of a framework such as Colorsim is, you can ba basically build your own simulation world. You can add things which you think, oh, this is missing here. I would need another process, another aspect, another vehicle, whatsoever. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. So confession, I have actually played many, many of these games. Usually they involve uh, cats and restaurants. <laughs> um, but I know that there's also kind of more, and these feel kind of more like strictly games, like you know, uh, Sims and like, there's actually a developer <laughs> gaming life. But that is actually really true. There is a, a kind of desire to, you know, and even like, a, you know, a Sim City roller coaster sim. There is a really interesting kind of maybe common human desire to make things work or make processes work or, or kind of look at something from like a 10,000 foot view and, and make connections. I mean, obviously, there's a whole fleet of games 
which I know I probably and my husband spent a lot of time on, but that is really a fascinating observation. And that, yeah. and, and, and to be honest, sometimes I even ask myself, do I do, still do science? Like, mm -hmm. do I do something professional? Or am I already half a game developer? Which is not a bad thing. No. Because one of the demos which I'm going to present tomorrow is about mining uh, water ice deposits on the moon. Mm -hmm. It's something which oh. I thought, that's a nice demo. And then I also created a nice visualization. So you see the, 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 the robots moving around, carrying the ice back to the base. It, it, in the end, my sons asked me, is this what you do for work? <laughs> I said, yeah. yeah. <laughs> dad, OK, so you're, we're play, you're playing games for a living, Dad. Um, I, I wanted to kind of touch on something. And, and you know, I, I know, like, so we're talking about, obviously, there's a lot of entertainment and maybe kind of like, you know, um, low stakes. These are kind of like low stakes simulations, right? And obviously, what you're working on is a lot more critical. There's like, you know, business and even to, to some extent us as end users have are impacted by work that you do and, and the folks that you work with. And obviously I think sometimes when we say, look at my, for example, cat restaurant simulation game, um, there's not a lot of fidelity there to, to real life. It's just kind of a very, very, very abstract thing that's more for entertainment. Um, what are the challenges in, you know, measuring fidelity, you know, being able to kind of assure, like assure, uh, you know, someone that you're working with, hey, like, you know, um, because obviously it's an abstraction, as you mentioned, it's going to be, you know, not 100% real life because there's going to be a thousand million different factors. How, how do you communicate? How do you gauge fidelity? How do you, how do you work through that with a client to understand like how you need to break things down? And, and I don't know, how, how do you convince someone that your model your simulation makes yeah, sense? That's, that's a very important question. So <laughs> the, the first requirement is that the process uh, under consideration is somehow digitized. So the, our partners, they need to be able already to measure at least what's going on uh, on a digital level, which is maybe, I mean, I mean, the case for many industries, but there are still a man, a many businesses which just run on paper. And clearly, if you run something with paper and pen, I mean, you cannot easily validate whether a simulation model reflects what's happening. Uh, so assuming that you have this level of digitization, what we then do is we actually take data snapshots from the real process. We configure a simulation model and then we simply compare the predictive accuracy. So we select together with our partners certain key metrics like the throughput in a manufacturing line or in a, the number of service calls being answered in a call center. And then we simply compare those numbers. And if the numbers do not match, which they typically don't at the beginning, then we uh, yeah, go back and start uh, working on the process definition again. So we really try to understand the processes at hand and what's influencing their performance. And then we iterate over the model a couple of times to success, I mean, uh, iteratively improves the predictive ability of our model up to a level where we think, okay, it's sufficiently good to then do the actual work in double quotes, which is <laughs> thinking about, okay, how can we make it even better? I mean, how can we plan better? How can we, I mean, assign resources better to tasks to uh, really improve the business uh, as, an, as a whole? So, um, yeah, that, um, that makes a lot of sense, uh, even to a lay person like myself. And, you know, I, again, I find it really fascinating that, you know, you're taking all these kind of complex processes and, and this like this, these are very real life practical things. Again, I'm always going to be speaking as an app developer. What we do, there's some concreteness to it, but it still feels a little bit ethereal now because it's just a, it's, 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 it's a digital UI. But I really love that you're using Kotlin for something incredibly concrete. It, there's still levels of abstraction and programming and, as we said, more visualizing than actual um, kind of physical processes, but you are, you are kind of, you are very directly, you know, helping a real concrete process. And as, um, and, and, and presumably, of course, that, you know, actually going in and, you know, changing a pro, like, like actually going in and actually physically changing processes would cost time, money that we, of course, many people don't really have a lot to spare now. So it makes sense that simulation might fill a gap there. You're totally right. It's, it's an extremely rewarding process also for myself. I don't need to play these mobile cat restaurant games anymore because I can go to actual factories and make <laughs> their processes better. Um, well, I, this is absolutely fascinating. I, I don't want to ask you any more about Coliseum in particular because I'm, I'm sure you're going to give an amazing and fascinating talk tomorrow. Um, but yes, please uh, definitely check out uh, Holger's talk. If, if any of this is interesting to you, and I think even as any of us that live in a world that are surrounded by processes, manufacturing, that use computers, that use semiconductor waf wafers and things like that, um, it is not just something that is in, of interest to us as Kotlin developers to see, you know, 
the kind of domains that you can apply Kotlin to, but also you know work that you're doing that is very concrete that kind of affect us kind of in a real way. I I absolutely love that. I'm gonna stop. I and of course I study this in academia, so that's why I'm being a total nerd about it right now. But watch the talk. Holger, um, if people wanted to find you on the internet and learn about what you're doing, how can they do that? So there's uh, on GitHub. You can find me easy on GitHub. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can approach me by email. And I'm also on the Kotlin Slack. Awesome. Well, um, I really appreciate it. I know you haven't uh, given your talk yet, so I really appreciate you taking time out of your talk prep time to come and talk to me while I geek out about uh, with you about like modeling and systems. But um, thank you so much again. Uh, and thank you all for watching. And we'll see you real soon. Thank you.